And we're back here at Singularity University Hub on the show floor at the summit in San Francisco where, as people tell me because I haven't <laughs> been out of here, uh, it's actually pretty foggy. We're here today with uh, Abhi Ramanan, who was part of our Global Solutions Program <laughs> two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, yep, right, 2015, co-founded a company called Impact Vision, about which we will talk quite a bit. I'm super stoked to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. You also co-founded two other companies. Yes, I did. Smaller, not really technology oriented social enterprises. Yeah. And we'll get there uh, in a minute. Yeah. So, Impact Vision yeah. uses hyperspectral imaging yes, exactly. to tackle the one trillion dollar <laughs> problem of food waste, correct? Yeah, exactly. That's so talk a little bit more about what yeah. is it, how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd been working in and around food for a while. I started a food business focused specifically on supply chain waste, but looking more at the consumer end of things, so creating a secondary marketplace for surplus products and trying to attribute a commercial value to that to start to challenge consumer perceptions around surplus. And the reason why I was really excited to go to SU is because I'd always been more community focused, kind of grassroots, and the opportunity to address some of the challenges in the food system in a more systemic way, looking at closer to harvest and using technology was really appealing. And so we actually, it just all started, we had a lecture by someone who was making satellites with hyperspectral capabilities, and he actually encouraged the class, look for on-earth applications, the sensors are becoming smaller and cheaper, and we're going to start to see kind of every industry wants non-invasive information. Um, it's of kind of great value, particularly for products which are perishable, have a short shelf life. Being able to do that type of analysis has a lot of value, and we've changed the core concept of the business has changed very little since that summer two years ago, which is to provide this analytics layer to interpret this world of new information from these sensors. So let me, I know that the audience, of course, surely knows what hyperspectral imaging is. <laughs> I have to admit, when we first met, like, you know, I was in that lecture, yeah. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I kind of knew somewhat what it is, but I really didn't fully grok it. Would you mind explaining to the audience a little bit like what is it, what is exciting about hyperspectral, yeah. how does it work, yeah. and how do you use it in your particular case? Yeah, absolutely. So hyperspectral imaging combines two different technologies, spectroscopy, which is a really well-established technique, technology that's existed for about 60 years, and that's the process by which you acquire chemical information from a single pixel, and hyperspectral imaging combines that technique with computer vision. So you're basically acquiring chemical information across hundreds or thousands of pixels. So why is this important? By looking at something, right? By, by from looking. From an image, by measuring reflectance. So you're looking okay. at reflectance across hundreds of continuous wavelengths, as opposed to just the three channels by which you and I, or a traditional camera, processes light. And what this allows you to do is access information in different parts of the visible spectrum, near infrared, and other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, where information exists in the world, it's just we're not able to see it. And so we then make software that gives information about things like the tenderness of meat, the ripeness of fruits, the freshness of fish, which either today are measured by destructive tests or visual inspections or aren't measured at all. And this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of waste and fraud in, in the food system, in the supply chain, because it hasn't yet to kind of benefit from these, these types of digital technologies that other industries have benefited from. And I mean, food is central to everything from water to energy, it's also very emotive, it crosses cultures, and I think it's it's, it's a tragedy that it has not had the, the benefit of technology, and that's why we're kind of trying to apply these, these tools to address some of those problems. So to explain this to my grandma. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what you're saying is effectively, if I get this right, and please yeah. correct me, right? Yeah. It's like, I can point a camera, let's say, at an apple, yeah. and can determine how fresh that apple is, or yeah. if it has gone bad. Exactly. So part of it is around being really specific, but basically that's the premise. You take an image and you're able to understand information about certain quality parameters. Mm -hmm. We try not to talk too much about things like texture, taste, freshness, because gotcha. those are more subjective kind of in human mm -hmm. concepts, but we look more at like shelf life in the context of like pH as a measurement or tenderness in the context of pressure that's applied in Newtons to cut meat. So how it actually works is we Let's take tenderness of meat. We take a hyperspectral image of a steak. We then carry out the destructive measurement, which is you measure the pressure applied in Newtons to a piece of meat. You repeat this process a few hundred times. You build a model that correlates information from the image, references it against the ground truth measurement. After you've done that a certain number of times, the system has learned to make that correlation by itself. 
and you don't need to use that destructive measurement again. And then at that point, that can be integrated in a distribution center within a company's supply chain processes and they don't need to rely on those destructive tests anymore. So ultimately, as a very simplified headline, I guess, yeah. you're getting rid of the best by date, right? Because you're giving me a real best yeah. by date. Or we are giving it, we're giving a much more accurate yeah. and, um, use. And today those dates are set in a really regressive way. And so you're actually right. losing a lot of value of the product. And then you have issues with markdowns in store, in store shrink, like in store waste and all these kinds of things, which are partly due to a lack of information or poor quality information and information that's only obtained on a sample basis. Gotcha. Fascinating. So where are you roughly today? Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what do you see is like the longer term, not just for your particular company, but like in, in hyperspectral imaging generally, what is the longer term like trajectory we're yeah. seeing like the next five or 10 years? Like I what do we need to look out for? What should we get excited about? Yeah, so a lot of people within the community, which is still fairly small, it's still a fairly emerging technology, particularly for industrial applications, well established in space, they talk about it as being similar to the next GPS. So I think within mm. the next couple of years, we can less than kind of max five years, within 10 years, I think we probably will have completely new ways of processing information. Smartphones probably won't exist, but on a shorter time frame, we have a partnership with a company, for example, that's developing consumer grade prototypes to start mass production in a year and a half to two years, which wow. will, they'll cost around $200 when they're when produced. So within a couple of years, sensors integrated into smartphones, consumers will have access to this technology. B to C spectroscopy devices are already available on the market. The reason why this is kind of valuable, is like an evolution of that technology, is because you can only tell so much from a single pixel. And it's great for some applications when you're measuring homogenous products, but if you want to look at complex matter like meat, if you do one pixel, it could be a lean pixel, it could be a fat pixel, you're not able to say anything about intramuscular fat, for example. Mm. For that, you need to measure the distribution of parameters, and that's what the computer vision element allows you. But in order for, so the hardware is becoming a commodity, three or four companies in the last year are doing innovations within that space. And so increasingly, the complexity is in the analytics, where before you had servers that could do like processing and normalization of the images and stuff, all of that's going to have to happen in the cloud and partly in the device. And that's, I think, what a lot of the development over the next couple of years needs to happen. But yeah, I think within two years, you can, with not every application in the world, but for some applications, you'll be able to go to a supermarket, take a photo of a fish and find out the species. That's wow. feasible. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we're, um, we're excited. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we first met at the Global Solutions Program 2015. Yes. We just wrapped up 2017 on Friday. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Like, for you coming out of the program to the point where you're now the CEO of, uh, of a company in a super hot, hot emerging small community <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. field. Yeah, absolutely. So I d didn't go to Singularity having with a background in technology, and I do think it is of great testament to SU that it has enabled someone with my background who had like domain knowledge, had started businesses before, but to be able to go on to start a company in a, quite a technical field, I think SU is quite unique in the world for being able to give people that opportunity. So I think that's been really transformative. I do love working in technology. There are challenges, of course, but. It's definitely enabled, I'd always been interested in technology, but then I studied social science. And so it's allowed me to go on to start um, a technology company and travel all around the world, get a really deep understanding of certain trends. Um, I think the, a really cool thing about SU is that you are essentially building a business for some point in the future. And finding a way to sustain yourself during that initial couple of years right. can be challenging, but you rarely see many other places that are kind of teaching you to build for a certain inflection point or look at certain trends. And that's probably the biggest thing that I took away from SU, like project into the future and create something for a point at which everyone has 5G and you know one billion people are going to be coming online and computation and image processing and all these things are becoming more and more widespread. So look at how you can utilize all of that. And that's a really valuable, I think without sounding like I've been too uh, indoctrinated because I do think there are absolutely limits to technology, but I think that's probably a little bit around that mindset yeah. um, shift. What was most surprising for you in this in this journey, for you personally? I started this thinking I will get questioned a lot about being a non-technical founder, and I thought the technology would be the majority of it. In fact, it is very much that 80-20 rule. I very rarely, A, get questioned 
about the technology in a capacity that I can't answer it. In fact, I probably overcompensated and now people think I have a PhD in imaging. And I clearly <laughs> tell, like our opening clearly was a PhD in imaging. <laughs> Whereas the business component, the value proposition, what is the return on investment going to be for companies that have single figure profit margins, haven't mm. updated their software since the 1970s, and would typically rather make an investment in a better pH meter than a sensor and software. Food industry doesn't do um, software as a service. It does, it's, it, so that by far has been the biggest surprise. I thought I knew food and I absolutely didn't. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Talking about new food, yeah. um, you had two companies Funny enough, like through the two years we know each other, I just now learned their names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One is called Pappy's Pickle. Yes. And Day Old. And Day Old, yeah. Um, tell us a tiny little bit about like what were you doing with those? What were they attacking? What was the problem you were attacking? Yeah, so Pappy's Pickles is, I'm Tamil, so I grew up my whole life knowing about the conflict in Sri Lanka and never felt like there was much that I could personally particularly do around it. And then I became, actually was inspired by a company based in San Francisco called La Cochina. And it's the first, it was one of the first incubators for Mexican, female Mexican entrepreneurs to start food businesses or work in, in food, which again is a kind of very male dominated industry. And that kind of spawned a lot of like social enterprise, food social enterprises around the world. And I was really interested in working specifically with Sri Lankan migrant and refugee women who came to the UK during the conflict. Unemployment is, really high in those communities and migrant women and refugee women are some of the most kind of marginalized groups in society employment is really core to the process of integration so it's it's a catering company and we cater weddings pop-ups we um, do street food and yeah do like mini restaurants and we basically train women from those communities to become chefs and earn an independent income and all the kind of additional benefits that come from participating in meaningful wow. employment. And the second one, Day Old, is also to do with food waste. We work with organic bakeries and collect the products that they don't sell at the end of the day, package them in beautiful Day Old branding, deliver to offices, places like PwC, and do like the more softer approach to awareness raising, and then donate the profits to child hunger charities in London to highlight those twin issues beyond just the model of donating surplus food to people in poverty, which doesn't actually address either of those underlying issues. It's about creating value, creating a commercial product, and reaching more mainstream audiences as well. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a, uh, a restaurant here in, in the Bay Area, uh, it's called the Mayfield. It has yes, a bakery attached it. to it. Yeah. And what I love about the Mayfield is when you go there, kind of like on their second serving in the evening, like before they sh close shop, they regularly bring you the remains of the day from the bakery and just give them out to their patrons, right? right. They basically say like, hey, do you want to take a loaf of bread? Yeah, because yeah, we yeah, were, yeah. you know, we were because to throw it away, to right? It. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah, I had, so, I've heard of the restaurant. I didn't know they did that, so, but that's, super that's cool. great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, um, kind of like in the, in the wrap up, um, mm. so you've been in, through GSP. Yeah. Uh, outside of the two technologies you now have a PhD in, which is <laughs> hyperspectral. I wouldn't, and, I wouldn't go and, that far. Uh, and image as well as AI. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you most, <laughs> what are you most interested in? Like, what is like, what excites you in terms of technology? What do you think has the biggest yeah. potential for change? It's a quite a big question. So within food, I think the alternative protein movement is monumental. I think in 20, 30 years, we'll look back and think it was absolutely abhorrent that we farmed animals in the way that we do today. So before I spoke earlier today, Memphis meats I think are absolutely incredible. So there's kind of various strands to this. There's a the whole pea protein side of things, but they're actually engineering tissue cultures in labs. It's not synthetic meat, it's actual meat produced in, and I think it's something like today, 23 calories in terms of grain is required to produce one calorie of beef, and they've got it down three to one. So in terms of energy efficiency, it's amazing. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. Less the B to C chocolate covered crickets thing more looking at like there's another really interesting company called gel tour that have created a synthetic or a biological replacement for gelatin so i think what's really exciting is only two percent of potential plant-based plants have been researched that have the pro properties to replace animal protein so it's only kind of opportunity ahead wow. so i think that's really exciting on a completely unrelated note obviously um a lot of the stuff with around Neuralink and human brain interface and how to increase the capacity of the brain. No, I, I don't think of the brain, I think it's a bit problematic to think of the brain as a computer. <laughs> but I do think that a lot of the work that is going on around increasing the capacity of brain, a lot of research into memory. Um, of course, AI is super hype, but I think 
neural networks are really interesting. I was reading recently about a technique um, called hierarchical temporal memory, mm -hmm. which more mimics the kind of neocortex and the way that it's structured in terms of, I think, yeah, anything that's looking at memory and how, how to create that and how to store information and process it more effectively, I think is really interesting. And, I, I, and more opportunities for, in developing countries, I still think that crowdsourcing or like utilizing the power of people, particularly for smallholder farmers and companies that are kind of aggregate simple, still SMS based mm -hmm. systems, but have managed to reach a tipping point where they're aggregating a lot of information in terms of like those kind of business models, I think is really interesting. A lot of, lot of great stuff, like interesting stuff in energy. Blockchain as well, I think has, I, I still sometimes struggle to see the like absolute use case for information to be distributed. I do get it, but it's, so I think that it has a lot of value in very specific, like some more specific, but I, I think probably I need to understand it a little bit, a, li a little bit better, but yeah. Well, so clearly you did your, your PhD in a whole bunch of areas. That's amazing. <laughs> No, um, I wouldn't say that, but yeah. So with that, I want to wrap it. Uh, this was Abby from uh, Impact Vision. Check out its impact. Your URL is impactbi.com. Impactbi.com. Impact yeah. So check that out. Um, Abby, thank you so much for Thanks being so here. Much this was for awesome. Thanks for having me. This was great. Thank, thank you. you.